So welcome everyone to part two of the Nutrition Speaker Series. This is Nutrition and Diet Mythbusters. We're really excited to be offering this series and we're so happy that you're able to join us today. This speaker series is hosted by Cadillac Fairview and is a part of the 2021 Occupant Engagement Program. My name is Courtney Colborn and I will be facilitating the Nutrition Speaker Series. I'm a registered holistic nutritionist and if you weren't with us on Tuesday, a little bit about me, I decided to pursue a designation in nutrition because I once realized the power that food had in my own personal health and recovery, and I wanted to be able to help other people learn to take control over their health and improve their quality of life. Holistic nutrition takes a more natural, individualized approach towards improving your health and wellness, and it's an all-encompassing all in nature. It considers your body, mind, and spirit, and really aims at achieving long-term health through the use of whole foods, um, some nutritional supplements where applicable, and different lifestyle techniques. Today, we'll be continuing the speaker series with the second session, Nutrition and Diet Mythbusters. I'm going to provide an overview of what was covered in the first session and what is to come in the speaker series, and then dive into today's content. Today, I will be breaking down some of the common misconceptions that come along with fats, protein, carbs, and sugars. In regards to fat, I want to talk to you about how the story of fat has evolved through the last few decades, what's good fat and bad fat, provide a specific example of two different products, elaborate on the good, better, best approach when it comes to oils, and some tips for getting the most out of your oils for cooking and dressings and talk about recommended intakes of fat. From there, we'll move on to protein and we'll chat about why people have become so obsessed with how much protein they're getting, how much you really need, and a this versus that comparison of some protein products versus homemade recipes. Then we'll switch gears and we'll talk about carbs, whether you really need to cut carbs to lose weight and how you can choose the right carbs and tailor your intake to make them work for you, no matter the style of diet you're following currently. We'll explore hidden carbs in different yogurts and compare flavored regular and Greek yogurts. And then we'll shift and learn a little bit more about sugar, talking about the different sweeteners on the market and those hidden in products and rank added sweeteners on that good, better, best scale. Finally, I will share some resources and recipes and wrap up with a quick question and answer period if there's some time. If at any point during today's webinar you have a question, please feel free to submit that in the chat box. And if we have a few minutes at the end, we will um, take some time to answer those. So you'll see on the screen here the upcoming speaker series sessions and what you can expect over the next couple of weeks. On Tuesday, we kicked off the series with part one, Nutrition Basics. And that was more of our introductory session. Today's session and then the following two will dive more into more specific topics and just really build on that information that we covered on Tuesday. Today's session, Nutrition and Diet Myth Busters, um, we're going to be breaking down some of those stigmas around fat, sugar, proteins, and carbs. And then we're going to take a break for a couple weeks and resume with the third session on Tuesday, August 10th. And that session will be Mindful Eating for Mental Health. In this session, we'll explore not only what to eat to support mental health, but how to eat with mindful and intuitive practices. And then we'll wrap up the series with the fourth and final session on Thursday, August 12th, and that will be greening your diet, the future of food. So in that session, you'll learn how you can reduce the environmental footprint of your diet in a way that really aligns with all of those foundational principles that we're gonna discuss throughout the series. I'm really excited for all of the great content that we have coming your way. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to register for the remaining sessions in this series. Um, don't fret, though, if you can't make it live. You can always watch them at your own convenience. Following the last session on August 12th, we will be sending out a follow-up email um, with the links to all of the recordings, as well as a PDF that includes all the resources and recipes that I mentioned throughout the series. Um, we'll also ask that you just take a few minutes to complete that survey so that Calix Fairview can continue to improve the Occupant Engagement Program and to offer initiatives and resources that you feel yourself and your colleagues would benefit from. Let's get started. I wanted to quickly touch on diet culture again. If you weren't with us on Tuesday, I talked a little bit about how diet culture has shaped the way that we eat. And I know that all of you have been exposed to these types of dieting messages that you could see on your screen, whether they led you to try a fad diet or restrict how and what you eat. We've all been impacted or know someone that's been impacted by diet culture at some point. And we all typically have kind of a food story. And that's really that one time in your life when you actually started to think about your diet and weight. And most likely that was related to a factor that was external to you. A lot of nutritional advice, whether from standard guidelines or fad diets, 
tend to oversimplify and prescribe that one-size-fits-all approach. Of course, that simplicity is really appealing sometimes, but it doesn't work universally as a way to really address health issues for everyone. When you take a more principle-based approach that embraces long-term patterns of nutritious eating, that will be more useful than one that mixes food groups or really obsesses over superfoods because no one food is super or could cure any sort of ailment for you. When we look at evolutionary nutrition, it typically always circles back to the standard dietary recommendations we already have. So that's limiting ultra-processed foods and increasing whole foods, and no one will really argue that. Today, I just want to take the opportunity to break down a few stigmas and myths around macronutrients, those fat, proteins, and carbs. And then, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about sugar. So I'd also like to mention that if any of the content we cover today feels overwhelming in any way or triggers your relationship with food, I always recommend that you speak with your family doctor or nutritional professional before adopting any drastic changes in your diet. If you've been stuck in a cycle of what's next with your diet and you feel like you need to improve your relationship with food, the next speaker session on Tuesday, August 10th, Mindful Eating for Mental Health, will really dive into fueling your brain to support mental health, but also explore not just what you eat, but how you eat with mindful and intuitive practices. So I encourage you to sign up for that session already um, if that's of interest to you. So let's break down some of the common myths and help you better understand that all foods are approachable and have a place in your diet, contrary to what you might think. It can be easy to make the right choices while still enjoying all those foods that you love. First up is fat. So the nutrition evolution of fat has been a turbulent cycle. That's for sure. I think everyone can agree with me on that. Fat in your diet was glorified in the early days, you know, not only eating it, but carrying extra fat was a sign of wealth. It was in the, about the 1940s that some scientific studies started emerging that showed a correlation between high fat diets and high cholesterol levels, suggesting that a low fat diet might prevent heart disease and high risk patients. By the 1960s, the low fat diet began to be celebrated, not just for high risk heart patients, but as good for North America as a whole. Around after 1980, more of that low-fat approach became really an overarching ideology that was promoted by physicians, the government, and the food industry as a whole. Many people bought into this idea that low-fat, even though there was no clear evidence that it prevented heart disease or promoted weight loss, and at this time, so many people that were following these low-fat diets were actually gaining weight, um, and a lot of people say that's what led to the obesity epidemic. The low-fat ideology had such a hold on Canadians and Americans that skeptics were dismissed and this idea that low-fat everything took precedence. As long as a product said low-fat on it, it was considered healthy. And it wasn't really until the mid-2000s that challenging low-fat diets and low-carb diets began a more moderate approach, and that really gained in popularity. So many people were noticing that low-fat diets weren't really making people healthier because when they were cutting back on fats, they were also cutting back on those healthy essential fats that everyone needs as well. Even more recently, fat in your diet has been celebrated or glorified when you look at diets like the keto diet. And those diets involve consuming so much fat that only about 5% of your diet is meant to come from carbs, and you're supposed to have a moderate intake of protein. So what does this all mean, and is fat good or bad, and how much should we really be eating? Well, your body needs some fat from food. It's a major source of energy. It helps absorb vitamins and minerals, and it's needed to build cell membranes, reduce inflammation, and is essential for blood clotting. For long-term health, of course, some fats are better than others. Good fats include those monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats that are on the right side of the screen. Bad fats include those industrial-made trans fats and overprocessed oils that are on the left. And then your saturated fats kind of fall somewhere in the middle. So trans fats are those bad fats because they're a byproduct of a process called hydrogenation, and that's used to turn healthy oils into solids and really just to prevent them from becoming rancid. There's no real health benefits with them and no safe level of consumption, and they've actually officially been banned in some countries. So Denmark, for instance, was the first country to ban trans fats and just in 2016. So they were often the most found in uh, margarines, vegetable shortenings, and that meant they were in a lot of commercial cookies, pastries, you know, your French fries and things like that. Trans fats uh, are linked to creating inflammation in your body, which is linked to heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. When you look at saturated fats that are in about the middle space there, they're not terrible in moderation, um, but not great overall if you're consuming too much of them. So those ones are solid at room temperature, like butter or cooled bacon grease, and they're often found in red meats, cheese, coconut oil, uh, commercially prepared baked goods, and they're meant to be consumed in moderation. When you look at your healthy fats, which are those monounsaturated, 
They're liquid at room temperature, really rich in your omega-3s and 6s, and they come mainly from vegetables, nuts, seeds, fish, and olive oil. Because of fats turbulent cycle through the ages, there's still many products on the market today that are promoted as low fat and fat free. So let's take a quicker look at an example of those to compare them. So on my screen, you can see a Kraft Italian fat free dressing on the left, and I have a Bragg's apple cider vinaigrette on the right. What I wanted to draw your attention to with these two products and just really emphasize is how important it is to be reading those nutrition labels that we talked about on Tuesday. So someone might be automatically drawn to the craft dressing on the left because it's fat free, only has about five calories in a serving. But when you take a closer look at that and you look at the ingredients, you have water, vinegar, sugar, soybean oil, modified cornstarch, propylene glycol, potassium sorbate, and the list goes on. There's no real ingredients here in this bottle and nothing that really provides any sort of health benefit, more of just kind of like an empty calories. Not to mention here that there's actually a whopping 360 milligrams of sodium in just a two tablespoon serving. So that's about 25% or more of your recommended daily intake just in that uh, two tablespoon serving right there. If you compare it to the Bragg's apple cider vinaigrette on the right, the ingredients include organic extra virgin olive oil, apple cider vinegar, honey, garlic puree, coconut aminos, dried onion, black pepper, and xanthan gum. So this dressing is made from whole ingredients there's no added salt. It's a really good low sodium option. It has nourishing and healthful ingredients that actually provide nutritional benefits. And because the Bragg's option contains extra virgin olive oil and not a mixture of water and vinegar, this option is going to be a lot more satiating than the craft. Um, you're going to be getting a good dose of your healthy fats, and that'll keep you feeling full longer and provides more a sustained source of energy. So since I mentioned the benefit of those extra virgin olive oils in the Bragg's dressing, that kind of leads me to my next slide. And I wanted to talk a little bit about oils. So oils are one of the staple sources of fat. And when chosen and prepared properly, they can be a really great fuel. Um, some oils are better than others, of course. What I'm going to be uh, explaining today is looking at these products on my Good, Better, Best scale. So Good, Better, Best is just an easy way to explain food products and how to approach and evaluate them. This is kind of a tool that you can use in your everyday food choices. Because sometimes, you know, it can be difficult to make the perfect choice when it comes to food. You might be out on the run, you may be at someone's home or limited in your options. So we can always make the good, better, best choice from the options that are available to us. A good option is, you know, not the worst option out there. Um, that's going to be on the left side of the screen here, followed by better, which builds on those good options, carries typically some more nutritional benefits. And then best is going to be one of the best options that you can purchase for a number of reasons. So when you take time to think about the options that are available to you, whether in the grocery store or while shopping or out to lunch, you'll be one step ahead knowing that you're making conscious decisions about what you're eating. When it comes to the oils on the screen, oils are usually marketed with one or more labels. So you're going to see everything from, you know, unrefined, refined, raw, virgin, cold pressed, and there's all unfiltered. There's a ton of different names and things that you can see on the packages out there. A refined oil is one that has actually been bleached or deodorized after its extraction. And oils treated this way lose a great deal of their smell and color. Sometimes uh, companies will actually add in a bit of scent or artificial color into that just to bring the color back after they've been bleached. So something to keep in mind. Unrefined means simply that it hasn't been touched other than perhaps to be mechanically filtered or to remove some of the impurities and that it hasn't been touched since the extraction process. So unrefined oils kind of taste more like the plants that they're extracted from. And typically, they may even carry some of that natural color as well. For canola oil, canola is definitely a really common oil. It's one of the top four vegetable oils consumed in North America. But however, few canola oils are actually considered healthy. This is mostly because canola is chemically extracted using a solvent called hexane. And the heat that's applied during this can affect the stability of the oil and turns it rancid, it destroys the omega-3s in it, and sometimes can even create trans fats as a byproduct. So while a pure canola is the best option for a canola oil out there, if that's typically what you go for, it's really important to choose a good quality bottle. So you wanna look for pure cold pressed canola oil. I've kind of included an example of a brand on the screen here, Maison OC. This is a cold pressed one that's actually made in Quebec. And when you're searching for the canola oil, this is a good one to opt for. It is going to be a little bit pricier than your other options, but just something to keep in mind. 
Um, when it comes to canola oils or other just branded vegetable oils, those are typically a blend of multiple oils that have kind of been overly processed or maybe lacking in the real nutritional benefits that you should be getting from your oil. So those ones, again, are refined, uh, referred to as refined bleach deodorized oils or RBD. And this kind of just describes that process that they're manufactured under. When you look at coconut oil, that one's often debated for its nutritional value. So you may have seen it promoted for tons of health benefits, like strengthening your immune system or preventing heart disease. Um, but it's also been called out as unhealthy just because it has a higher saturated fat content. It does contain lots of healthy fatty acids, antimicrobial properties, and things like that that are known to help kill harmful pathogens like bacteria and viruses and fungi. But based on the conflicting information available about coconut oil, I view it as neither a superfood nor a poison here. I say that it should be consumed in moderation along with other oils in your diet. Avocado oil is next up. So this one's pressed from avocado fruit. It's more mild in taste and the high smoke point makes it popular cooking oil, but you can also consume it raw. It's really similar to olive oil in terms of its utility and its nutritional value. And like extra virgin olive oil, cold pressed, Avocado oil is unrefined and retains some of that flavor and color of the fruit. So it is actually a little bit greenish in color, so don't be alarmed by that. Finally, olive oil is said to be one of the healthiest oils available on the market. So they're not all created equal. There are virgin olive oils, and those are which the oil has been extracted without using any chemicals. And extra virgin is just the highest grade of virgin olive oil. So the extra virgin olive oil contains more than 30 different phenyl oil compounds. And those are phytochemicals that have really good anti-inflammatory benefits. For olive oil to be certified extra virgin, it has to be first cold pressed. And that just indicates that the olives never exceeded a certain temperature during the pressing process. There are some tips for the best ways to store, use, and consume your oil. So for storage, you want to make sure that you're not storing your oil near or over the stove. Certain oils can become rancid if they're exposed to light, heat, and oxygen. Instead, store them in a cool, dark place. Um, if you tend to take longer to consume your oils, you can extend their shelf life by storing them in the refrigerator. Exception being for co coconut oil. That one is uh, solid at room temperature, so it doesn't need to be stored in the fridge. Um, you've probably seen different oils sold in tin cans. So for olive oil especially, this is because it can be damaged by light and exposing it to heat or oxygen causes those nutrients to oxidize. So just make sure if you have olive oil in a clear bottle that you're not leaving it out um, on the counter or somewhere where it gets direct sunlight. Some of those more delicate oils benefit from also being stored in the fridge after opening. So those would be your avocado, grape seed, sesame, and walnut oils. For olive oil, if possible, try and look for harvest dates if those are available on the label. And you want to stick to an olive oil that's actually been harvested and bottled within a year. And don't be confused by those best before dates. Just because the oil can last for a decade doesn't mean that you should be consuming it that long. For best quality and flavor from your oil, aim to use it within six months to one year of your purchase. Um, some oils may need to be used even sooner than that. You know, while wine gets better with age, oil does not. So the quality and flavor will really weaken as time goes on. Uh, another important thing to note about oil is their smoke point. So the smoke point is known as the burning point, and that's the temperature at which the oil begins to smoke up and lose its integrity. So if it starts to smoke, it can release chemicals that will give your food a really bitter flavor, but also produce free radicals that can be um, really harmful for your health. You can see a high level classification of some of those smoke points for commonly used oils on the screen. And I'm gonna share a resource later that you can visit that really breaks down all the exact smoke points and how you can choose the best oil for your meal. So how much is too much when it comes to fat and what do you need? Most sources recommend you know, that about 20 to 35% of your total calories can come from fat. If you're consuming a, you know, a 2,000 calories a day, that would be about 44 to 78 grams of fat. And if you're looking, say, at olive oil as low as your main source of fat, a general rule of thumb may be about two to four tablespoons daily. Next up is protein. So many people worry about protein and if they're getting enough, um, especially vegetarians and vegans, they're constantly being told that they don't get enough protein in their diet. Um, and while protein is a key building block for our cells, our bodies take protein and break it down into amino acids, and those are necessary to build muscles and, you know, make bones and blood and fuel for energy needs. But how much do you really need here? Americans actually spend $3 billion a year on protein supplements, and the average consumer in the U.S. ate more than 200 pounds of red meat and poultry in 2018. 
So research is indicating that many people are getting way more protein than they need, and too much, too much protein has been linked to health complications like kidney damage, vitamin mineral deficiencies. In 2016, the government actually recommended that adult men and teen boys reduce their overall intake of protein and increase the amounts of vegetables because so many people were eating these giant portions of meat that were twice as big as that they needed. And then on top of that, they were having protein supplements and snacks and things like that as well. So there's just been a lot of confusion and a disconnect between consumer behavior and science. And one of the biggest trends in the diet food industry are protein snacks and supplements. And the basis for a lot of those fad diets that are out there is focusing on getting more protein in your diet. Governmental guidelines say up to 35% of your diet could safely be from protein. And that intake will, again, still depend on your lifestyle and your age factors. When there's too much protein in your diet, it can lead to increased calcium excretion in your urine, and that raises your risk of osteoporosis. And not to mention that really high protein diets are often quite low in whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, which are some of the best sources of vitamins, minerals, fibers, and antioxidants that are going to keep your body healthy. Most people tend to get their protein from animal sources, and those are also high in sodium and saturated fat. Um, your recommended protein intake really varies depending on your lifestyle and age factors. For example, you know, a pregnant or nursing woman will require more protein than when not pregnant or nursing. Um, but as a starting point, without factoring in exercise, age, or lifestyle, the average adult needs about 0.36 grams per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 160 pounds, that would be about 58 grams of protein a day. Older adults, again, will need more protein to offset natural muscle loss that occurs with age. And some say that men on average require more grams of protein per body weight than women. That's mostly just because they, you know, they have more muscle mass and a higher caloric intake than women. But again, this really depends on the individual. So it's important to spread out your protein intake throughout the day as well. If you say that you, um, for instance, someone may eat a 10 or 12 ounce steak at dinner, which is the equivalent of 90 grams of protein. So the, it's an insane amount of protein with a huge serving of meat. And you actually get the same muscle building benefits as someone who eats only a third of that steak at the same meal and they're having far fewer calories. And that's because according to a study published in the Journal of Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, it's better to space out your protein throughout the day instead of having this bulk of it at dinner, and that'll help for better muscle synthesis and allow you to absorb more of those nutrients. Another study in 2017 um, found that spreading protein evenly across three meals a day increased muscle strength in adults over the age of 67. So for here, it's just a lot about moderation and variety is key. If you eat meat, then you want a good combination to come from both animal and plant-based sources. And if you're a vegetarian or vegan, then being cognizant of better sources of protein is really beneficial. For instance, tempeh, nuts, seeds, edamame, chickpeas, lentils, those are all really great sources of protein. And don't ever feel like you need to have this hyper-focus on protein um, that's really been promoted in so many fad diets and consumer products. You know, typically you're going to be getting most of what you need through the foods that you have. And as long as you're just making conscious decision and effort to incorporate more of those foods into your diet, you'll be off to a great start. Let's look at an example of a pre-made protein pancake mix versus a homemade banana pancake version. So on the left, you can see a homemade banana pancake recipe. This has some simple ingredients, just banana, eggs, vanilla extract, oats, and cinnamon. And then on the right, you have a pre-made protein pancake mix. So we're immediately drawn to this product and their claims, the idea of this high protein, easy to make meal. But when you take a quicker look at the ingredients, including refined sugars and oils, the nutritional info is worse than a simpler and frankly much cheaper homemade version. When you look at calories, the homemade version comes in 80 and 83 calories or less. And the fat, um, the fat content here is comparable. There's about 15 grams less carbs in the homemade version versus the pre-made. And of course, there's more protein in that pre-made, but it's coming from a processed um, protein isolate here. So the sugar is only coming from bananas in the homemade recipe on the left. And on the right, you're getting refined sugar sweeteners in there as well. You're having a comparable amount of protein here, but I'd say that one of the most concerning factors is the sodium. So the homemade version on the left has, um, you know, just 32 milligrams of sodium, and the pre-made version on the right has 600 milligrams of serving, uh, 600 milligrams of sodium a serving. So that's about 35 or 40 percent of your recommended daily intake. If you join Tuesday's session, this is just another reminder of how important it is to read the labels on the products that you're purchasing. If you also don't need to be buying, you know, 
spending all of your money on these protein pancake mixes and protein supplements. You can just keep it simple with natural whole ingredients and provide your body with more benefits that will also save you money in the process as well. Let's talk about carbs and do you need to cut carbs to lose weight? So there's this really unhealthy stigma associated with carbs that, you know, they're all fattening, but really they're not created equal. When you're trying to lose weight, you're bound to get confronted with wildly varying opinions and advice about carbohydrates. Should you eat less of it or more? Um, should you be cutting carbs? There's just a lot of confusion out there, and the answer really lies in balance. So it's not carbs themselves that can lead to weight gain, but it's more about the type, the quantity, and what you're pairing them with. So because carbs are a macronutrient, they're in more than the obvious things like breads and pastas, but they're in a lot of other foods like fruits, vegetables, cheeses, and dairies. Different types of carbs break down sugar at different paces depending on the fiber content in them. So if you're looking to lose weight, then yes, you should most definitely reduce your processed goods, baked items, sugary drinks, and sweets as they contain a lot of those empty calories. But not all low-carb diets are necessarily healthier. Just by cutting our carbs from your diet, um, that won't necessarily make it healthier. In fact, you actually need carbs to provide your body with energy, and not consuming enough can make you feel more sluggish and hinder your productivity and things like that. A healthy carb-rich foods provide essential nutrients like fiber, vitamin B, iron, and folate, and it just really boils down to finding the right balance of carbs in your diet. Carbs are the most convenient source of energy for your brain and your body, and they don't just come in flour, grains, and sugars. They're also in beans and fruits and vegetables, with higher carb amounts coming from your starchier vegetables like your potatoes, peas, corn, and squash. Your digestive system takes, um, breaks down all these carbs into glucose, so the simpler, more refined the carbohydrate, like potato chips or candy or even white bread, the quicker that that's going to be broken down into glucose and the quicker those sugars are going to hit your bloodstream. That quick energy might be a good thing if you need a really uh, quick and easy boost, but what you really want is more slow burning energy that lasts. So the more complex and whole the carbohydrate is, like a piece of fruit, beans, or rolled oats, the longer it's going to take to break down into glucose and the more slowly it gets into your bloodstream. And that's just because of the fiber, so it's slowing down that absorption of sugar. If you eat a simple carb that has no protein or fat, like a piece of white bread with no fiber, it starts being converted into glucose as soon as you start chewing, and this leads to that rapid increase in your blood sugar levels, and that triggers your pancreas to release insulin, and that's that hormone that helps process glucose and store energy in your fat cells. So by maintaining stable blood sugar levels, you can help reduce the risk of developing insulin resistance, diabetes, and heart disease, and easily um, manage your weight. It also helps maintain stable energy levels and mood. So you want to enjoy your high quality carbs and pair your foods properly. So this means carbs like whole grains, beans, fruits, and vegetables that will have those good sources of fiber. When you look at food pairing, you want to determine what works best for you when it comes to carbs. So you can kind of use simple food pairing techniques when creating a meal to tailor your carb intake. So say you were looking to lose weight. When it comes to slimming down, two or more foods can be better than one food alone. That's because each has different nutrients that work together, and as a team, they can help keep you feeling full longer, they can burn fat better than if they were eaten on their own. So more specifically, you should be always pairing your proteins with a complex carbohydrate. Anytime you eat a carbohydrate food, think, what's the protein that I'm going to have with this? So the sugars are absorbed um, and used by the body for energy from the carbs, and the amino acids from the proteins are used by our cells for other processes like building muscle and hormones. And when you eat a carb food, your body breaks it down to sugar. Naturally, your blood sugar is rising as that sugar is being absorbed. But when you pair those carbs with those protein foods, it really reduces that spike in blood sugar and helps you better control your appetite and those internal processes. Some powerful food pairs um, include a whole grain crackers with hummus. So the crackers are going to be your carb-rich food here, and the hummus is your protein-rich food. Um, a protein-packed be breakfast with eggs, black beans, and peppers. You could do that kind of in like a stir fry that provides protein, healthy fats, and fiber. And the eggs contain metabolism boosting nutrient called choline. And the peppers are a good source of vitamin C. And make, getting, making sure that you have enough vitamin C can help fight off uh, elevated cortisol levels. And cortisol is actually a hormone that causes fat to accumulate around your midsection. So getting enough vitamin C and choline in your diet is also important. Another one would be, you know, bananas and nut butter as providing you with some complex carbs, protein, and healthy fats. Great go-to snack or pre-workout on the go. And the same kind of goes for veggies and cheese as well. So as a rule of thumb, if you're on more of a weight loss journey, 
then you want to avoid eating a meal that's high in fat and high in carb. So when you pair high fat, high carb together, that's going to trigger your body to um, take in some of those fat storing functions. Instead, you want to pair your proteins with healthy fats and your complex carbs with proteins. Like chicken and avocado or eggs, avocado and greens, um, these all are going to kind of provide you with more of a clean burning fuel. I wanted to draw your attention to a common food product that, you know, typically you wouldn't necessarily consider the carb content for um, and how sugar affects carbs. So when it comes to yogurt, there's so many different kinds on the market. Um, what you might gravitate, gravitate towards at the store, whether that's non-fat, low-fat, full-fat, what about flavored yogurts, or do you sweeten them on your own at home? Uh, there's so many different options that it can be kind of overwhelming to choose the best. Yogurt can be really beneficial in your diet and does have a place there. So there's tons of gut-friendly probiotics, protein, and calcium, and not all varieties of these are created equal either. So when you're considering more of a, a good, better, best approach or this versus that, you want to consider the amount of fat and the amount of sugar and additives in the yogurt. Because the sugars and other additives, these actually also affect the amount of carbs in your yogurt. So tread carefully when you're in that aisle of fermented milk products. Some manufacturers actually have a knack for cramming as much sugar and artificial ingredients into yogurt pots and bottles as they do candy bars, and then they're just marketing them as this picture of perfect health. So again, just another reminder, really important to be reading your labels here. Um, often those yogurts that are marketed as low-fat and non-fat can contain more carbohydrates. On the screen, you can see on the left, we have a strawberry-flavored light play. So this one's marketed as being a low-calorie um, with a third fewer calories than the leading low-fat yogurt made with real fruit and having zero grams of fat. But then when you take a closer look, it may be low-calorie, low-fat, but it actually has 15 grams of carbs and 7 grams of sugars in that as well. When you start moving towards the right and you're looking at Greek yogurt options, so in the middle, we have a Greek yogurt that is vanilla flavored, and this is comparable in calories to that Yoplait, but it has more protein and less carbs, and you would be surprised that a vanilla flavored yogurt actually has two grams more of sugar than that Yoplait strawberry flavor. Um, oftentimes, people will assume the vanilla flavored yogurts, you know, don't have as many sugars in them because they're not, you know, strawberries or raspberries or have all those other types of um, fruits in there as well but they do typically have a sweetener in there included in them as well. You go to the right side of the screen, your best option is going to be your plain Greek yogurt. Of course, the most boring option is going to be your healthiest option here, um, but this one is best for your overall nutrition. So it includes a higher amount of protein versus non-Greek, and it has healthful fats, including anti-inflammatory omega-3s. Um, it has fewer carbs and the most protein and the least sugar. But I know that plain flavor taste, of course, is a little off-putting, and it's more of a sour cream taste than anything. Uh, there are simple ways that you can flavor your yogurt at home with vanilla extract or fresh fruit, and that'll make the most of your yogurt and make it a little bit more exciting. Mostly when it comes to yogurt, uh, you just want to watch out for any of those flavored or fruit on the bottom yogurt. Uh, they can really have pack a lot of sugar in them. Some of them have, you know, 12 plus grams of sugar in a small serving, so Best to sweeten your own yogurt um, at home yourself with some fresh fruit or maybe a honey and maple syrup. And that kind of leads me to my next section, which is about sugar. So it's really important to remember that there are two categories of sugar in your diet. There's naturally occurring and added sugars. Naturally occurring sugar is found in some fruits and some vegetables like beets, pumpkins, and zucchinis. And as such, those are coming with, you know, a really vitamin-rich package that has fiber and healthy phytochemicals. Those naturally occurring sugars are also um, in yogurts and other dairy products that come up through the fermentation process and other cheeses and things like that. Added sugar is sugar that's added to foods, and that's often during that processing process. So added sugar is the kind that you need to be limiting in your diet and keep an eye out for and really make smart choices about the sources of the added sugar. Added sugar, no matter the kind, really has no nutritional benefit. All added sugar is empty calories, meaning that it's calories without vitamins, minerals, or other nutrients. Um, there are some more naturally occurring than others. For example, you know, there's a white granulated sugar versus a honey. Um, and there's different options out there in terms of the sweeteners. But all sugar typically strokes inflammation in the body. So when we're taxing our bodies with too much added sugar, it can really contribute to the production of compounds that feed our body, body's natural inflammatory processes. On Tuesday's session, you know, already know the potential health risks you face and how chronic low-grade inflammation plays a big role in the development of illness and various disorders like heart disease and diabetes. So 
wherever possible. It's just really important to be limiting the amount of added sugars that you're consuming. For decades, food scientists have been developing all these different alternatives to sugar. Um, you know, we have such a demand in the market and people want sweet foods. They want these options. They want to have their cake and eat it too. Um, they want a healthy cake. But most of these sugar substitutes are produced chemically. And, you know, while they're generally safe for consumption, the FDA has approved them um, and approved all of the compounds that you can see in the artificial sweeteners on the screen here, like aspartame, sucralose, stevia, monk fruit extract. Um, you know, they're considered safe, but they're not necessarily healthy. So most artificial sweeteners are highly concentrated, meaning that you either need to use less of them to provide a similar taste of sugar, or you can use them one-to-one. -one. Uh, some research indicates that these sugar substitutes may cause an increase in your appetite, and they can impact your digestive health. So really important to make sure you're choosing the best options here. Uh, a little bit more specifically, so aspartame, I'd say, is considered one of the worst artificial sweeteners out there. That one's been linked to effects like headaches, nausea, fatigue, more serious health impacts like heart palpitations and anxiety attacks. So I'd say avoid consumption at all costs for aspartame. Sucralose, that's really popular. You're going to see that in a lot of low-calorie snacks, uh, protein bars, and things like that. And that's actually made by using a chemical process, and it makes it up to 400 or 700 times sweeter than sugar, so you need less of it. But it's been linked to increase in blood glucose levels, you know, um, not recommended for people with diabetes or blood sugar issues. And it's also been linked to a decrease of that healthy bacteria in your gut. So really important also not to use sucralose in baking because it may release harmful chemicals or compounds when it's heated. When you look at your xylitols and your erythritols, those are considered sugar alcohol. So they're um, created by combining a sugar molecule and an alcohol molecule, and they create a new substance. Um, the only positive thing about those is that they're actually not absorbed the same way that your body digests sugar. So often your xylitols and your erythritols are recommended for diet, <clears throat> excuse me, diabetics or people's blood sugar issues. They do have that lower glycemic impact and zero calories, but they have been said to be fermented by the bacteria in your stomach. And often people will say that they experience a lot of bloating and gas when they eat um, xylitol and erythritol on a regular basis. Monk fruit extract is a tabletop sweetener. So that one's touted for being zero calories, zero carbs, and zero sugars. And coconut sugar is digested by your body the same way regular sugar is. However, it doesn't contain as much fructose as your refined sugar. It has a lower glycemic impact on blood sugar than refined sugar. And it's become increasingly popular for being kind of that more natural alternative to your white refined sugar. It's made from actually boiling down and dehydrating the sap of coconut palm flour. When you look at kind of a good, better, best approach with your sweeteners, um, dates, honey, maple syrup, and coconut sugar, I would say, are your best sugars or sweetener alternatives or additives if you're looking to add those into your baking, um, your yogurts, or just sweeten up your smoothies and things like that. The occasional use of stevia and monk fruit are okay, um, but, and the wor I'd say the worst sweeteners, again, would be those sucralose, aspartame, high fructose corn syrup, like I mentioned on Tuesday. Even you'll see brown rice syrup as an ingredient on a lot of granola bars and things like that. Again, that's just a, a heavily processed syrup that's made from brown rice, but it's super sweet. Um, so again, that's best to be avoided. Uh, if you're baking and your recipe calls for brown sugar, I'd opt for trying coconut sugar out. You can see on the screen it kind of replaces brown sugar in terms of its quality. You can use it in a one-to-one -one ratio, and it actually doesn't contain as much fructose as refined white sugar. So I encourage you to give that a try next time you're baking something up. Uh, next, as we move to the right on the screen, a better option would maybe be, you know, your honey and maple syrup. They're still sweeteners, but they contain, that contain sugar and carbs, but they're more in their natural state. They undergo less processing. There's no bleaching or deodorizing that happens with these. Um, some people will argue that they carry some nutritional benefits. I would just say that they're kind of just a better option for some of your other sweeteners out there. Uh, finally, dates on the right. So they're a great option for a sweetener and as a snack. They offer tons of nutritional benefits and lots of fiber and potassium and magnesium and antioxidants. And some people even say that they can be really helpful for pregnant women as a way to induce labor. You can add dates to you know, your smoothies or chop them up and add them to your cereal, and they're a great alternative. 
Again, when it comes to uh, sweeteners, it's just about making the best choices with the options that are available to you. As much as possible, you want to limit those sugars and added sweeteners. But when it's time, just try to choose from some of those options that I mentioned. I'd just like to quickly share some resources with you. So if you're interested in learning more about, you know, some of those top nutrition myths uh, that was released this year in 2021, you can scan the QR code on the left of the screen there. For more information about how to choose the right cooking oils and their smoke points, you can visit the resource on the right. Again, like I mentioned, we will be circulating a, a PDF resource at the end of the series that includes all of these links, so don't feel like you need to rush to grab them right now, but if you would like instant access, um, you can scan those QR codes with the camera on your phone and it'll take you to the website. And then I just wanted to share a couple recipes. So here I have on the left those five ingredient banana pancakes that I referenced in the protein section, really easy to make. In the middle, you have a few different ways to sweeten your plain yogurt at home. And then on the right, there are some homemade vinaigrette recipes to make your own healthy dressings at home. So those ones are really great options as well. So with that, I'll wrap it up with a few key takeaways. Um, you know, I think that foods are just always approachable in different ways. And it's just makes it's best to make the best choices that when you have those available. So I'll see if we had any questions come in from Ailish. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Courtney. Um, so we've got a couple good questions here. So the first one is how much protein can your body process in one meal? So he, um, the person's asking, for example, if you consume 40 grams in one meal, is 20 grams all that your body can process and the other 20 is just wasted? Or how does that work? Um, it's hard to say down to a specific gram amount how it's processed because it's kind of on an individual basis. Everyone has a different rate of their metabolism and things like that. Um, but typically, you know, you're not, what you want to do is not overburden your body with too much protein at one time because your body's going to be working overtime to break everything down. When I gave that like 10 ounce, 12 ounce example of a steak, which was about 90 grams of protein, um, you, that would say that about 30 grams would be absorbed because if someone ate, you know, a third serving size of that, they were absorbing about the same much. So I'd say, yeah, about like a third to a half, depending on the serving size. But about, I would say, if you have 20 to 30 grams of protein in a meal or a serving, it's a safe bet to go. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, there was a couple of comments about those banana pancakes um, and whether or not they had flour. I don't think they did because you said they were a five ingredient pancake, but just wanted to confirm uh, if there's any flour in that or if oats are the main replacement for flour. Yeah, no flour in those, it's just the oats. So often if I'm making um, like even a muffin recipe or a pancake recipe like that, I will just throw my oats in the blender first and I'll grind them up into a flour and that'll be my flour alternative. So you can explore that. But all the instructions, I just brought up the slide here. So you can scan that recipe there, it's just the oats. Awesome, thank you. Um, next one's about Greek yogurt. So is Greek yogurt better than regular yogurt? So, in my opinion, I always tend to opt for Greek yogurt over your regular yogurt. Um, it depends when you're looking at the type of yogurt, the milk that they use in the process. So if you're looking at like a low fat yogurt, then they're going to be using a skim milk in the process of making that yogurt versus more of a full fat yogurt or even a 0% milk fat or a Greek yogurt. They're using a uh, full fat milk and you're just been getting a lot more of those nutritional benefits from the milk than um, and the dairy than if you were opting for more of that low fat option. So I tend to go for Greek, more protein, typically less carbs um, and less sweeteners than just regular yogurt. Um, but there's still a place for regular yogurt as well. Great. OK, and two more questions just super quick because um, we're out of time here. One, is the recording going to be available for later viewing? Yes, there will be um, a recording of all the sessions of the Nutrition Speaker Series available at the end of the last, uh, or sorry, just after the last session. So keep an eye out for that. Um, somebody's asking, how many nuts should be consumed daily? Should you soak nuts for a few hours before consuming them? Oh, that's a good point. Um, some people will say that you should soak your nuts to kind of start that activation process or the uh, sprouting process so that it's a little bit easier for your body to break them down if they have kind of a tough outer brand. So that's something you can do um, as an option. In terms of serving sizes of nuts, uh, there was a resource that I shared on the last session. If you want to look it up from Precision Nutrition, a portion control guide, and they kind of break down, you know, in terms of serving sizes for fats, 
uh, you know, in terms of thumb sizes and things like that. So a couple of tablespoons, it depends the type of nut that you're eating um, and how many you can have, but you can check out that precision nutrition guide for some helpful tips. Great. Thanks, Courtney. Okay, well, I think that's all the time we have for today. And we got through most of the questions there. But if there's any outstanding questions that you'd still like to ask, feel free to join us for the next session. And we uh, hope to get to those then. But otherwise, thank you all for joining. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks for session number three, which Courtney, remind me again, that's on, is that August 10th? Yes, August 10th. Okay, perfect. Well, we'll see you all then. And thanks so much for joining. Thank you.